Um, in Globsec, as you know, we consider ourselves the constructive voice of Central Europe in the Brussels bubble. Um, and, uh, and we've been uh, working extensively with uh, Ukrainian NGOs, Ukrainian think tanks. We've just opened up an office in Kiev. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, we, we believe it is, uh, it is absolutely imperative to work for organizations like us to work with Russian Democrats. And um, maybe some of you have, have looked at BBC World today, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a very intricate uh, and interesting report with interviews um, about Vladimir Karamurza, who is uh, one of the uh, members of the Free Russia Foundation, actually vice president of the Free Russia Foundation, who is now in prison in Russia uh, for, for, for exercising his, his uh, normal rights as a citizen. So um, that to set the stage here. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to present and briefly present and then hopefully extensively discuss with you a report that was initiated by Andrius Kubilius, right next to me, former Lithuanian Prime Minister, member of the European Parliament, also the, uh, the, the, the shadow, shadow rapporteur on... No, not shadow, the, the, the chief the, the standing rapporteur on, on EU-Russia um, in the European Parliament. And uh, he initiated this study that was, that was finished by a couple of uh, authors, actually before February 24th, but was printed afterwards, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm one of the authors, and a, a couple of them are, uh, like Vladimir Milov right next to me here, are also authors of that study, and it was edited by the Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies, where I used to work for 13 years. So um, that there are still a few copies left on the table over there next to the entrance, uh, but you will get the most important points of that uh, from, from our speakers today. Just a few weeks ago, in European Parliament, during plenary session, Joseph Borrell have said that uh, since EU was so heavily dependent on Russian gas, till now, till the war started, uh, EU had no uh, proper EU policy towards Russia. So now when uh, this dependency is going down very heavily, uh, we hope that you know, really it's time for for European Union to have a proper policy towards Russia and especially towards future democratic Russia. That was the aim of our paper, to elaborate some ideas. Because with Roland, with Vladimir, with Sergei Guriev, we are you know, representatives of uh, perhaps uh, not the majority of Europeans whom we call believers in Russian democracy. My feeling is that non-believers, uh, perhaps for time being, are in majority. But things will change. I think that we are witnessing crucial historical moment. I am uh, you know, trying to compare it with Berlin wall collapse uh, in 1989. And I hope that quite soon we shall see, if I may use that metaphor, how Kremlin walls of you know, autocracy kleptocracy, you no know, aggressiveness will collapse. That's my, my vision. The question is really how we can, from EU side, how we can help this moment to come, and you know, after that moment will come, how to help new Russian democracy, reborn Russian democracy, to become really a stable, uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in a stable way established in Russia, because we, Things that Russian people deserve a normal European type of life, like we are living here in Brussels, with its, of course, you know, peculiarities, uh, national, you know, features, and so on and so on. Uh, in order to achieve such a goal, we need to see, in a again, in a clear way, that there is, at least in my view, there is competition of two dreams inside of Russian society. One is bad dream. Another is good dream. Bad dream is to uh, reestablish empire, which, which is pretty natural in post-imperial societies. Unfortunately, you know, instead of having De Gaulle like it had happened in, in France when De Gaulle helped you know, uh, France in 1950s to overcome all that nostalgia to imperial past, Russia has Putin, who is really trying to play you know, dirty games with that, with that nostalgia. 
Uh, second dream is dream to have a normal life. I don't believe that Russian people are different from other people, you know, who have such a dream always, to have a normal life. The question is, you know, now, how to do that, you know, the first bad dream would be abandoned, and the second good dream would be, you know, would be established and would, uh, you know, would, uh, would increase in its capacity to convince on the people. So the bad dream can be, you know, destroyed by really, you know, our assistance to Ukraine to win the war by international tribunal, and I would elaborate too much, but uh, you know, also with Ukrainian membership in NATO. That's my clear, uh, clear vision. If that dream will be, you know, destroyed, then the good dream, dream of normal life, could be strengthened by our assistance from EU side. First of all, you know, if we shall have clear strategy, what kind of relationship we shall build in between of EU and, uh, and you know, democratic Russia. Having in mind uh, free trade, visa-free, you know, maybe some kind of new type of association agreements, modernization agreements, and so on and so on. In addition to that, of course, uh, what EU needs to do is to invest very heavily into creation of Ukrainian success through Ukrainian integration towards EU, which would be a you know, good example for you know, Russian people to follow. And that is what we are trying to achieve. And that is why we are you know, proposing, because it's, it's not only what is needed for Russia itself. It's also very much needed for Europe. Because that would create, you know, if, if that will go and become you know, a reality, it would create totally different, you know, environment, totally different architecture on the whole European continent. And that is why we want Russian opposition people to work together with us in developing some kind of the strategy. And that is why we are going all together to Roberta Mezzola, because we think that the European Parliament really is the best institution for promotion of democracy on the whole European continent. And I stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this general intro. And uh, Natalia, can you tell us a little bit more about the Free Russia Foundation? Sure. Just um, thank you so much. Uh, just a few words about our organization. But first, let me uh, profoundly thank our co-hosts, uh, Globsec, uh, Roland, you and your team. I know it's uh, very stressful to gather people on such a short notice. Um, but um, I don't doubt when uh, there are more successes of uh, pro-democracy forces uh, in the cause of... Um, uh, change in Russia for the better. We'll be gathering very fast stadiums. <laughs> more people will be believing in uh, that it's uh, actually uh, possible. Uh, and also, uh, let me thank uh, all our uh, colleagues uh, from different organizations. Uh, uh, Russia Foundation uh, initiated that trip, but uh, we also have uh, uh, here at the panel, but also in the in the audience here, uh, our friends and colleagues from different organizations. Uh, we have. Um, uh, Navalny's team and uh, also uh, Free Russia Forum and Ivor Committee, Boris Nemtsov Foundation for Freedom, uh, Activatica. So again, we are all together. We all have the same dream of uh, having a free and democratic and normal, predictable Russia. Uh, maybe even Russia, a boring country when the biggest uh, scandal is uh, some kind of a doping scandal at the Olympic Games. Um, I think it will be good for everybody. Uh, and uh, also... Um, and just a few words that uh, we are a do tank. First of all, we those who like roll up the sleeves and work in, on the ground, uh, uh, helping um, Russian uh, pro-democracy movement, civil society, independent media inside the country. But now, of course, more and more in exile, um, in, uh, in exodus. Um, but also um, uh, helping our um, Belarusian colleagues uh, also in, inside the country and in exile. Uh, from day one of our establishment, working uh, together with uh, many Ukrainian organizations, and one of the biggest programs that we have is advocacy on behalf of Ukrainian political prisoners held in uh, Russian jails. Um, and of course, uh, since uh, the full-scale uh, invasion started, we also started to work on the issue of um, prisoners of war and forcefully deported Ukrainians. Uh, and doing many, many other things together with us, our <laughs> Ukrainian colleagues, including uh, some stratcom communications uh, for in-country audiences just to try to change uh, public opinion inside Russia. Um, we have always been a do tank, also a little bit a think tank, including working with some uh, Brussels-based uh, think tanks uh, uh, and uh, um, releasing some research uh, reports uh, on many important issues. Uh, but... Uh, as many of you probably also 
have to become a humanitarian organization as soon as, um, again, on February 24th, basically. Um, saving people uh, from Ukraine, uh, running evacuation buses uh, from Ukraine, and later uh, when the mobilization was announced in Russia, from Russia as well, just... Um, uh, so doing a lot of things. Um, uh, the most uh, important thing why we are here is again to show to the world, to show in Brussels that uh, there are a lot of uh, pro-democracy Russians, uh, anti-war, anti-regime, uh, those who want to change Russia for the better. Um, while the uh, priority of everybody of us to stop this war, um, the victory for us is not just um, some kind of a ceasefire um, truce, uh, but uh, like complete victory of Ukraine, complete defeat of Putin and uh, regime change in Russia so that again um, Russia is, doesn't, uh, is not a threat any longer uh, to its neighbors, to the democratic world, to the globe in general and to its own people. So this is our most important task, uh, which is very hard, but we believe in it, we are committed to that, we understand skepticism of many people, but we cannot afford uh, not to believe in this course. We, we have to do that, what Putin did on February 24th and earlier in 2014 and 2008 and so on is absolutely unacceptable, unforgivable, and, uh, um, but at the same time, it was such a suicidal thing for this regime uh, because it just expedited its expiration date. All dictatorships eventually fall, and so we believe in that, and uh, our biggest battlefield will be for the values of the Russian society, which is another huge task in front of us, but again, we are committed to this work, and uh, with your help, I think we'll be more effective. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Volodya, you're next. Uh, thank you very much, and many thanks, Roland and Globsec, for organizing this. Uh, and again, sorry for uh, a little bit of a short notice, but we realized at some moment that there's be a very significant group of various pro-democracy Russians representing the whole spectrum, so probably that will be a good moment to arrange the, the very much needed discussion on uh, the future of Russia, and uh, uh, right now I agree with Andrews that uh, you can hardly find a lot of believers in, in the Russia's democratic future given the current circumstances. But listen, I'm 50 years old, uh, and uh, through all of my life I've heard a lot of these wise people who were saying nothing in Russia will ever change. At the same time, the situation in my country was changing like a roller coaster from Brezhnev's relaxed Zastoy to Andropov and Chernenko repression uh, to Gorbachev's perestroika uh, to Yeltsin's uh, chaotic democracy. Then we had several very different periods of Putinism, very distinctive. All of the time there was this perpetual status quo party saying that nothing will ever change. I think the worst uh, period was 20 years ago uh, when Russia was ranked partly free by the Freedom House when Putin was hugging at summits with Bush, Blair, Prodi, and everyone, he was attending the Rome summit with NATO, speaking, quote, uh, we are building the common security space from Vancouver to Vladivostok, which is supported by vast majority of Russian population, which was very true at the time. There was over 70% positive attitude towards uh, United States of America and uh, so on. At that time, when we should have been raising the alarm about the early autocratic trends, there were many people who say, but what could possibly change? We were a democracy now. We just, uh, less than 10 years ago, we overthrown the communist regime. We have free television, free parliament, and, and so on. So it's really important to think long term, not to repeat the past mistakes, because Andrews, uh, uh, recall the collapse of the Berlin Wall. I would recall another moment from 30-plus uh, years ago, uh, George H.W. Bush chicken key of speech. Uh, when, when this whole thing finally collapsed, many people in the West had no idea what to do with it now. And that was, that was a big mistake. So we should be better prepared this time because eventually this moment will come. So I think we, we probably should have thought about a different title for... for for this paper, no more chicken Kiev speech. <laughs> uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, as, as hard as it is to believe in the Russia's democratic future at the moment, all the objective data, not the media headlines or like catchy figures or hand-picked, cherry-picked parameters, but all the objective bottom-up data 
suggests that Russia will inevitably be a democracy in the future. Because if you look at the behavior of Russians, they have never accepted dismantling of the democratic institutions. M great majority, super majority of Russians always, in, during even the highest years of Putin's popularity, wanted free direct elections of regional governors, mayors, heads of districts. If you ask Russians what they are unhappy about, lawlessness, беззаконие, absence of the rule of law, the basic rule of law, inability to influence the governance in any way. You can essentially find it in uh, any uh, reasonable poll. In rare cases where we have competitive elections in the regions, uh, we see a huge surge of in turnout. Right now, when elections are controlled administratively, turnout is extremely low. But whenever there is competition, people come because they are finally interested, fundamentally interested in that. Uh, yes, on the background of the current propaganda, you hear a lot of people who speak out some imperialistic stuff. They resonate with what the state TV has to say. So you might think there's a lot of them. Is there really? No. I think the biggest cure for that, you know about Alexander Dugin, who in the West is somehow considered to be the architect of the, the ideologist of the imperialist policies. Just go on YouTube and Google Dugin na mitinge, Dugin speech at a rally. You would barely find more than one or two thousand people in the audience. So bottom-up imperialistic rallies don't gather many people. Anti-war, pro-democracy rallies do. Just remember the peace marches uh, that were held in Moscow and other cities with Ukrainian flags. Tens of thousands of people attending. Putin or imperialists will never be able to, to gather that without uh, people being forced in uh, through administrative uh, mechanisms. So I won't go into like long detail, uh, but objective data from the ground suggests that there's a, a genuine bottom-up demand in Russia for democracy. Yes, it is a raw demand. Yes, Russian population should be uh, significantly enlightened and educated about what is actually going on. One of the recent polls suggests that only 10% of Russians, 10% of Russians were actually aware that during the present war there was fighting going on in Kyiv region of Ukraine. Only two regions are mentioned by more than 50%, Donetsk and Lugansk. Most of the population is simply unaware about what is going on. So yes, it will be a long and painful work to explain to the Russians what is happening. But we believe that first, there is a genuine bottom-up demand for democracy and not otherwise. And second, uh, it is very dangerous uh, to think that there can be other options like isolating Russia or whatever. Isolation means emboldening the imperialists. It means that Russia will be perpetually dangerous. It will replenish, regroup, and strike again. North Korea is isolated for many decades. Doesn't make it any less dangerous if you visit Seoul, you'll find gas masks in the hotel because uh, people are always preparing for a strike, invasion, or whatever. So isolation is not an option. I think to, to finally achieve a stable solution of the Russia problem, the only way forward, however difficult and painful this is, is to work with the Russian population to achieve a functioning democracy. It is very hard, there are no guarantees, but we do have a lot of experience from the democratic experiment of the 90s. We more or less know what to do. Some of the suggestions are in this brochure, but we'll be happy to discuss more, and I'm sure my colleagues will have a lot more to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, next is Dmitry another one of the, yes. the authors of the study. Thank you. Th thank you very much for having us here. And uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the in initiative of Mr. Kubilius to create uh, the EU Parliament Democracy Hub. So it's very important in the context of uh, Russia's war against Ukraine and uh, mass emigration from our country. You know, Russian, the Russian opposition was always criticized for not being united. And we're here in order to say that we're going to unite. We're going to represent uh, the Secretariat of European Russians in Brussels. 
because uh, as a political, uh, <clears throat> as Brussels is a p political capital of Europe, so uh, most of the European institutions and organizations are located and, and work in this city. That's why it's very important for us um, uh, to organize work uh, in Brussels on a systematic level. So we see um, a European uh, Secretariat of European Russians as the key platform of uniting uh, different, I would say, almost all anti-war, pro-democracy, pro-European uh, groups of exiled Russians for the purpose of opposing Putin's regime and uh, stopping the war in Ukraine. Uh, as you know, as, uh, since February 24th, more than I would say several millions of people fled our country and unfortunately this process is likely to to continue in the future and uh, i think it's very uh crucial for all of us to establish a dialogue with with uh, russians and europe to help them stay in their professions uh, and get involved in different activities focused on uh, uh, counteracting putin's regime and its uh, destructive influence uh in europe and uh, I think that we need to figure out how to to engage with, with Russia in the future, how to help our country all together, how to help it to, uh, with its successful transition from authoritarian regime to a democracy country, yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, I wanna tell that, uh, in my opinion, it's very important work over here because uh, it's important to lay down uh, principles today uh, and we have to avoid mistakes of uh, uh, 1991 uh, uh, when uh, Russian Democrats uh, didn't have a plan what to do actually. Uh, so the system cracked down um, pretty fast. Yeah, and Chicken Kiev, it's, uh, it, nobody was ready for it. And now we have to actually have a uh, plan of democratic transit because in my opinion we'll have just suppose around one and a half and or two years and uh, for a long time we've heard that Russian opposition uh, reunited that we have uh, several groups which can't uh, communicate uh, with each other but today uh, we see uh, here it's Navalny group uh, we with Dmitry represent uh, anti-war committee and uh, it's very important that different groups, they work uh, with a plan of democratic transit. And uh, I wanna uh, fix uh, several uh, things which in my opinion very important, the common ground of uh, ideological, ideological common ground of Russian opposition. Firstly, it's a rejection of the imperial path and uh, of the development, I mean Russia, including a return of uh, occupied territories yeah for a long time uh, some of russian uh, russians uh, did not say loudly that uh, Krim, uh, crimea must be returned but nowadays i think it's uh, absolutely common ground after 24th of february so uh, the second point is decentralization and uh, establishment of uh, federalism i mean real federalism in russia because now it's uh, fake federalism and we have a uh, uh, system with a uh, centralized system. Uh, third one, abandonment the uh, super presidential republic uh, uh, and uh, transition to parliamentary republic. Uh, I think uh, now it's uh, pretty common that uh, when we have one person uh, as a head of state, it's uh, uh, after a few years, it's a uh, it's gonna be a dictatorship or something like this. So uh, uh, I think parliamentary republic is pretty common stuff. Uh, we have uh, more specific uh, questions, uh, not so maybe important for now. Uh, it's discussion about constitution, in my opinion. Uh, we have to uh, change this constitution in the, in the future Russia, but as I said before, specific uh, issue. So, uh, and uh, I am very optimistic because uh, this uh, ideological ground, uh, it's a um, very important uh, step forward for us. And I think uh, this work, uh, which uh, uh, was made by our colleagues, uh, it's, um, uh, it's very important because in the future, during uh, democratic transit, 
we definitely, uh, I mean, Russian democratic movement uh, uh, must be supported by whole free world. Because it's not uh, just a problem of Russia. It's a huge problem of uh, international uh, security, including nuclear nuclear uh, aspect. Um, I, I, one explanatory remark here, the chicken Kiev speech. Maybe the younger ones in the audience do not remember that. Um, so uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, in uh, 1991, 19 or 1990, gave a speech in Kiev where he advised Ukrainians to take it easy on independence. And this is this became like a metaphor, a, a, like a um, a proverbial example of, I should say, appeasement out of ignorance. Right? Um, it was certainly not ill will. It was not. It was not a complete disregard for East Europeans, but it was just his ignorance of the actual situation and the the incapacity of his advisors to to brief him properly. And uh, play Andrius. Of, no, no, just play of words because she can keep. Is very famous, you know, dish in, in the restaurant in Kiev. Indeed. <laughs> National. <laughs> yes, there were also some jokes about radioactivity after Chernobyl having to do with that. But anyway, um, so having said that, uh, I think, I think there's, there's so many things we should discuss here now. It's like this distinction between the regime and the citizens. The question of unity of, of, of the Russian opposition. Uh, the distinction between empire and democracy, and like like one is not possible without the other, uh, not one is not possible with the other. Sorry, um, uh, they cannot they cannot be combined. Um, also, the question of, uh, 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 for example, visas uh, for Russian citizens, visas for draft dodgers. About uh, Russians not protesting is absolutely not true. And um, uh, everybody is quoting uh, over the info numbers, uh, 16,000 now more, like 20,000 uh, people detained uh, for their type of activity. Uh, Again, it's very difficult for the info to track all the numbers. A much more uh, important number, f uh, in my perspective, is number one, uh, and this is uh, June 13, when no Russian was detained for anti-war activity. Every other day since the beginning of this full-scale invasion, in some regions, some, somebody is being detained, so some uh, protest uh, activity is happening. Uh, unfortunately, it's very underreported at the moment because, uh, uh, again, since the full-scale invasion, all the uh, independent uh, media outlets were forced out from Russia. Uh, and we don't hear about even all those mentioned uh, 20,000 cases uh, from these uh, reports. Uh, we hear, like, here and there <laughs> what's happening. But, in fact, very often we learn about uh, cases of protest just when uh, some human rights defender starts working on some case. And then through the case material, we see that, like, for example, women in some region blocked the road or there was some, 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 something, something else. For example, uh, also what we hear more like um, de derailing of trains or uh, setting conscription centers on fire or some graffiti activity like um, some other like media partisans doing like in, in public messaging uh, initiatives. But there are many, many more. The map of those protests is huge and uh, it's impo especially important that so many infrastructural project projects were forced out from Russia. Like again, Navalny's team is a lot of them are in exile. A lot of civil society um, organizations, many, many, as I mentioned, media outlets and so on. So it's and the price for your activism is much higher. Uh, again, you can be in jail just saying the word "the war" for 15 years and things like that. So this is happening. Uh, plus, uh, uh, an exiled community also got very, very active uh, and uh, um, like. Just, uh, I don't know, 80% of uh, exiled Russians in Georgia, all their uh, um, uh, initiatives are focused on helping Ukrainians uh, and then something else, <laughs> some uh, messaging or anything else. So, again, uh, we do protest. Um, again, we... Hmm. Uh, very often when we help Ukrainians also, we, are, we don't do it publicly. We do it in a discreet way. Uh, when we were running our operation, uh, vacation buses from uh, Ukraine, uh, again, we didn't do it as Free Russia Foundation, of course, it was uh, more neutral branding, but it was much more important for us to save people's life instead of, uh, again, hyping on the PRing that, no, again, this is not the time for us. But many of the Russians we know donate to the Ukrainian army, do some, like, uh, I don't know, a lot of anti-war activities, um, persuading the population. We see a lot of opportunities now when 
25-30% of uh, Russians uh, stopped trusting into television, which, which is huge, and now this is the time for us to increasing our effort on, again, public messaging, and we do that, uh, so many initiatives can, can, can tell about that. Maybe Vladimir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the messaging, uh, there is no one magic key. So you have to try all of it. Uh, some people really, f for them, uh, an eye-opener is the uh, information about the atrocities that the Russian army commits in Ukraine. Uh, some people uh, look at the economic consequences and the downturn and the impact of the isolation of Russia. For some people, obviously, mobilization was the eye-opener. It, it's it, Unfortunately, this is a much slower process than we'd like it to be. Uh, because, again, I, I was speaking at Strasbourg last week in a World Forum for Democracy. I said, listen, there's a full room here. If all these respected uh, people were put uh, in one room for 20 years with only one TV set showing Putin's propaganda, what's, what's the chance that you will be repeating this stuff after sitting 20 years in this room? So it's really not that easy to break through, but we're making it. And generally, I think the message is that, look, the government is lying to you all the time about pretty much everything. So why would you believe them in this particular case? And I think also what is important, uh, Russians really are hungry for the actual facts. Uh, they, they really pay attention when they learn some useful new information. Like I made a video for my YouTube channel, almost one million views, about this eight years in Donbass, which is pursued by the Russian propaganda is a genocide against Russian-speaking people. And I've just demonstrated some basic facts, like who were the founders of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic? Borodai, citizen of the Russian Federation, birthplace Moscow. Girkin, Minister of Defense, citizen of the Russian Federation, birthplace Moscow. <laughs> Keep uh, Field Commander Motorola, citizen of the Russian Federation, birthplace in Uhta Kome uh, Republic. People go like, wow, we had no idea. We thought it was genuine residents of Donbass actually fighting for independence uh, against Ukraine. So facts versus outright lies and propaganda that is being spread by the Kremlin. Again, much slower than we want it to be, but uh, it works. Enlightenment works. Countering disinformation works. I just, I just wanted to come up with one follow-up question to, to, to Volodya is, after the so-called partial mobilization, we were uh, talking a couple of weeks ago, and you told us about your messaging to those new recruits, um, this three-stage uh, advice you give to them, how to act in the best interests of uh, themselves and indeed of Russia and Ukraine and Europe. So can you repeat that? Uh, yes. Uh, so we, we, since the beginning of the war, uh, we were uh, conveying a consistent message to all the Russian men uh, that possibly couldn't have ended up fighting. Uh, just don't cross Ukrainian territory. Uh, you immediately become aggressors against the peaceful, sovereign country where we have no business being present with arms. And if you, by chance, end up or, you know, by force or otherwise, end up in Ukrainian territory, never engaged in uh, any armed actions uh, on the battlefield or against Ukrainian population, just leave. Surrender or simply leave and go back to Russia, but don't get engaged into any, any uh, military activity and, and so on. And we are issuing, through our broadcasting, we're issuing a lot of detailed instructions. We believe that many of the people who are actually avoiding uh, drafting right now, they are following our advice. And Putin gets uh, far less, what is, what is important, far less skilled military personnel. Because a lot of the draft dodgers that Roland uh, mentioned are, are really skilled, trained, and they can potentially be uh, worthy fighters, but they do not want to fight. They do not want to do anything against the people of Ukraine. And uh, I think our messages also play a role here. So uh, I, I, this is what I call the five-year-old syndrome. Uh, I was teaching my five-year-old son to learn how to ride a bicycle. He recently turned six already, but he still can't. And it's a painful process because he keeps falling all the time. And he was, he's saying, never. I, I will never ride a bike again. I, I'm not fit for doing this. This is not my stuff. And I said, son, no. 
You just got to try a little better next time. Please use this technique or that technique. So the fact that first we did not have a terribly successful democratic experiment in the 90s is alone insufficient to judge that uh, Russia will never become a democracy. The fact that Russian opposition uh, is not able to overthrow yet uh, one of the most potent and strongest totalitarian regimes of the modern era alone is not enough to judge that we are incapable of uh, changing things. Just, I mean, in terms of what we've done and what we hadn't, look at what capability of street protests we have mobilized in the past, let's say, six, eight years. Okay, peace marches after uh, the beginning of the invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine. You think Putin just simply announced as an extremist movement up to 15 years in prison uh, just to be connected with Navalny's network for nothing? No. This is a medal of honor, a recognition of our capability to actually move and change things. He cannot go forward without completely banning us because he understands that we're going to win. So we have to operate in this slightly more different new environment. And listen, we're not asking you for a free lunch. We're simply here to tell you uh, what kind of different work we are doing to change things. If you want to help, jump on board. If you're skeptical and just want to watch, okay, that's your choice. But we believe that we'll be able to recruit allies that way because we're doing a lot of good and useful things at the end. I don't know who wants to have free lunch. <laughs> uh, just two points. Uh, was it a free lunch for Germans after West decided to help you know, denazify uh, Germany? No, that was not free lunch. And that was very much needed for the West. No, in general. So I see a lot of parallels now. It's our interest to have you know, Russia different. It's not only Vladimir or Ivan or whatever you know, else interest. It's also our interest. That is why we are trying to see what we can do. And first of all, we need to look why Russian democracy failed back in, in 2000 with Putin. And I do not see here really guilty of Russian society. I am always, you know, repeating and repeating again and again.